The other day on the way to Serials, I spent an hour and a half stuck in a traffic jam with Minette and we were going to do a live video but there was no signal so we recorded it and here it is. It's like a bonus video for you. Glad I tied up my car. <laughs> you say tied in your hair. Yeah. <laughs> right. I don't know when, I'm, when I publish this video but, but me and Minette are on our way to Serials. The hotel is a mile away and we've been sat in traffic for half an hour now, haven't we? Yeah, good half an hour. To, to go about a mile. So we think there's been an accident, we've seen the police car go down. Anyway, we thought we'd have a little chat in the car because I think everyone knows what Manette does at the NFU, but not many people know much about you. So what has been... What did you want to do when you left school? Oh, What gosh. did you want to do when you are in school? <laughs> well, I, I, I wasn't working hard. That's one thing uh, for sure. Um, I, I was. It was all about horses for me, uh, Ollie. I was. Um, I, I was. That was all I wanted to do was was ride. And I left school. Uh, went and worked for uh, David Ellsworth, who was champion national hunt trainer at the time. I rode thirty point to point winners. It all I don't seems know what like point to point is, but yeah. <laughs> sort of steeplechase basically. Right. Um, racing around a, a track with 30 other. I always remember saying to Peter Kendall when, uh, before I got elected deputy president, and he said, um, he said, how are you gonna let people know that you've got balls? And I said, well, I wrote 30 point to point winners. He said, well, that means you've got balls. So <laughs> theoretical. <laughs> um, so, so it was all about that. So that's what I did. And uh, mum and dad were farming in partnership, time limited uh, with our landlords, with my landlords now. Uh, they were always on this 25 year partnership that dad knew was going to come to an end. So he was always saying to my brother and I, don't think you're ever going to farm because you're certainly not going to farm here because the partnership will have ended. So I guess that gave me a, a thing in the back of my mind that uh, uh, you know, I wanted to farm and one day I would. And then I suppose the mid 90s, uh, I managed to do a deal with the landlords and secure uh, an FBT 25 years with the option to renew and started farming with 20 suckler cows and a pretty derelict farm. So that's that's where it started. So how old were you when you grew out of horses then? Um, how old was I? Probably late 20s, yeah. So you haven't got any at all now? We have, yeah. Therein lies some of the problem. Yeah, we have. My, so my daughter uh, rides um, and my mother still stayed quite keen on breeding them. So as far as I see at the moment, I pay for them. <laughs> <laughs> so, we were just sort of, before we come live, we were talking about um, if you step down in February, which looks like you're going to do, what are you going to do with your time? Well, I think I know now, you're going to get take horses back up. <laughs> I, do you know what? I'm just going to take, I'm going to take three months out and uh, I'm probably sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll get bored. I think I will get bored. I think the relief of the pressure, because it is massively pressurised and I take the responsibility incredibly seriously and the pressure is you know day in day out every week of the year and so not having that will feel a release but i think probably give me a couple of weeks and i'll be bored yeah do you think it'd be hard to adjust to that i i do because it's been 10 years 10 extraordinary years and it's hard to prepare for that because at the moment it's it's you're on call 24 7 you know the press will phone me any any time over a weekend um and so it is it's just been you know literally my life and so i think um yeah i think it'll be odd and i think i'll need to prepare for it yeah so obviously we did the, the combine thing and we, there was four of us that spent seven days together and it was an amazing experience and everywhere we went people talking to us and whatever and then i got on the spray yesterday morning on my own and that was normally my happy place on my own and i just felt like something was missing i was just like you know, like I forgot my phone or my key. I just like, it was weird. It's just, yeah. and I rung Martin up and I said to him and he said, <laughs> he said, yeah, no, I feel exactly the same. He said, I kind of like being in a boy band. <laughs> Cause that's what it was like. You know, everywhere we went, everyone knew us. Cause to be fair, they'd come to see us in the combine. But like, that must be like what it's like for you every day. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good way of looking at it. You've got, you've, you know, you've got your support structure effectively. Tom Reese rung then and it cut it off, but um, I can edit it back together. So we were saying about, uh, we felt like we'd been in a boy band with Manette. Everywhere she goes, um, everyone knows who she is and wants to talk to her. But I mean, they still will know who you are, I suppose, won't they, when you've finished. But it, but life will be a lot different, won't it? L life will be a lot different. And um, yeah, it's it's hard to, I mean, I've been through such, uh, 
I guess, emotional extremes from spending nearly two years, you know, leading the NFU from my farm. I can't remember where we were up to. Tom rang again, uh, wondering what's going on because we're obviously stuck in this traffic. Um, we were talking yeah. about support structures and leaving and... Yeah, you're going to be... It's going to be a lot quieter. And you, but you must be fed up with living out of a suitcase. I mean, if you weren't how many miles that suitcase is done? It's done a lot of miles, yeah. Yeah, I, look, it, I mean, it, I love the farm. I obviously miss my family when, uh, when I'm away. My kids are off. They're on a gap year at the moment. They're off to uni. So it's, it is all changed, but we've got... We've got a lot going on at the farm. Um, the weddings are, you know, going well. The beef side of things is going well, and I've had to cut. I've had to simplify everything. So I'm, I'm looking forward, if I'm honest, to farming again because, because you can't. I mean, I do the weekends and stuff, but you can't, you can't be as involved anywhere near in your business as, as you, you know, as you would be. Mm. And I miss, you know, I do miss that. Ten years is a long time. Uh, well, I know, yeah, yeah. It's, um, I think, was it Myrig had worked out how many, how many shirts he'd worn or something like that. Yeah, I think he had, yeah. Yeah, um, or uh, how many Hillary had ironed, was it? <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, that's right, it was how many Hillary had ironed, I think. Because they did do six years, was it? Myrig did four years as president, and I think six years as deputy. Oh, nice, yeah. So he did it. So he did ten years, so that. That's uh, that's three thousand six hundred. <laughs> yeah, a lot of shit. We won't talk about how many glasses of red wine he drank in that period. <laughs> I could never keep up. What's what's been your favourite day? Oh, doesn't goodness. have to be NFU related. Yeah, I mean, I I tell you what meant the most to me was when we were in lockdown, twenty twenty, June twenty twenty, and I'd picked up the phone to Jamie Oliver. And as you, I, do. I, as you do, I'm such a nice so guy. Make me tea. <laughs> so, such a nice guy. I spoke to him for two hours on his birthday. I didn't realise it was his birthday until <laughs> he told me. But he wrote that open letter to Boris Johnson. I managed to email um, the mail group, got um, the mail to publish the letter. That was quite difficult because they'd fallen out and Jamie Oliver didn't want to put anything in the mail. And then and then literally we were able to bring in whoever we wanted to write letters in the mail building this campaign you know mm. we started in the autumn we had 20,000 sig- and and then it, it you know it kicked off i th- i think we started it all in may and you know it, the stories were running in the mail every week and the numbers were building and we got into june and we got we got a million people and the good thing about that campaign and that petition was that we had embedded in it you could either sign up to be a Bat British Farming supporter 500,000 people so half of the people that signed up mm. on the petition became Bat British Farming supporters and then one weekend we said if you want to email your MP uh, you can and here's the template letter and 80,000 people emailed their MP and MP I mean the MPs were furious um, <laughs> absolutely furious so they they, I remember my MP phoning me up and saying, is this you? <laughs> it, so 80,000, how many MPs are there? Four, 500? Yeah, I mean, it was, what they didn't like was they felt it was sort of NGO tactics. They felt it was sort of behaving like Greenpeace, but they weren't, nobody was listening. So we had to literally, you know, mail bomb them and, and they did start to listen. And of course, Liz Truss was then in DIT. And we wanted this statutory trade agriculture commission. We wanted it on the front of the trade bill, all this primary legislation. And she kept on telling me, you'll never get it. We will not put it in primary legislation. Well, in the autumn of that year, it got onto the front of the trade bill and the reporting element went into the agricultural act. Now we were working with a massive majority government. So ultimately they could just do whatever they wanted to do. But that, that commission will be there uh, throughout, it's done reports on every trade deal. The evidence is there for all to see, and you know it's it's been absolutely essential. It, it never went as far as we wanted it to. Nothing does, but that's probably my most special moment is getting that over the line because because for once, for once, everybody came together: chefs, farmers, environmental NGOs, animal welfare experts, consumer reps, everyone, because the message was so simple. 
everybody came together. What's the worst, Dana? Oh gosh, there's been some low, low moments. Um, I can remember when we were in lockdown, you know, all the guys in the out of home market, those that were supplying Costa, dairy wise, growers, people just phoning up in, in tears, absolutely devastated that their business had just gone overnight. Obviously then there was government support packages. Some people survived, some people didn't. And I found that very, I found it very hard to deal with because you, you couldn't do anything. And, and you were, you were stuck, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't see anybody. All you could do was keep answering phone calls. And of course, for those supplying retail, you know, I can remember people in the cabinet, you know, messaging me and saying, you can, you can have whatever you want, labor wise, whatever you can have, whatever you want. Um, I remember Henry Dimbleby, you know, he was a chairman of the non-exec board and DEFRA at the time, you know, everybody thought we were going to really run out of food and, um, so it was this extraordinary situation where those supplying the out of home market and that's how I got to meet Jamie Oliver because he'd done so much for the specialist cheese makers who had no market. I can remember talking to the team at Long Crawson and um, you, you know they'd had all this cheese mm. and uh, it, it couldn't be exported, it couldn't be sold and so we were linking them up with retailers and and getting this cheese sold and, and that worked, that kept a lot of them going mm. um but it was such a weird time and then the other thing was you know do you remember everyone was panic buying loo rolls mm. nobody ever knew why that was there was never a shortage nobody ever knew why that was but people ate so times i think of challenge disaster whatever people go back to what they're comfortable with so everybody was eating mints they weren't eating steaks they weren't they were they, they literally did not know how to eat at home as they had done out of home because mm. they weren't going to the pub they weren't going to the restaurant bar. maybe that's where they went to the toilet and that's why they need to have a loo roll <laughs> you know, know who knows you fell over it was it was just the weirdest weirdest thing so that that felt you know that that felt very odd and then you know when i decided to stand for the last time in uh the autumn uh two two years ago 18 months ago um, I thought it would be two quiet years, you know, and then and then March and, you know, Russia invades Ukraine. And I can remember and still now, I mean, talking to Maria Didak, who's the um, Ukrainian Agrarian Forum director. Oh, I mean, we don't know how lucky we are here. Well, I, well, mean, that's it, it? I mean, what they're living through and farming through. And I mean, I just think they're such a, an amazing, resilient, yeah, People. I mean, I, I've lucky enough. I've, I've been th four times actually to Ukraine, and they had it rough before the war. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know that—that's the top and bottom of it. I mean, and, and a lot of that as well is the weather. You know, they—you know—they had to ensure because they didn't get rain. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, it's yeah, it's a uh, difficult. We we are so lucky, and it it makes me laugh when you know the media will just jump on anything and just not shut up about it whether it's caking down in street, Philip Schofield, you know, they just they just go on and on and on and just think, just look at the rest of the world. And, yeah, you know, yeah, and, yeah, and see what's... I mean, I've just come back from um, the World Farmers General Assembly, uh, was out in South Africa, and I've just come back from there, and I mean, you just got these massive extremes of poverty that you just can't imagine, and, and wealth that you haven't seen. I mean, just these really different dynamics but for farmers out there you know uh, on farm murder torture is rising you know yeah no we, we, we're lucky in britain aren't we so where's the nicest place you've visited because you've obviously traveled oh. the country nearly as much as i have in the last week i mean there's been some amazing place i mean that has been one of the one of the real pluses treats if you like of this job is that you've seen things that you just never would have seen mm. and i can remember being uh doing a farmer meeting down in in devon and uh andrew butler who's been our county advisor down there for a long time he said i'm going to take you down to um a pub he said you won't have seen it anything like it before and it's a place called it's an estate called clavilly and you literally go down this it's like driving down a cliff really and it's cobbled mm. 
and there's this pub right on the seafront and you, you I promise you you would you would just never know it's there and it's right on the seafront phone rang right on the seafront lovely cove never know it is there yeah so but i guess what i was trying to sum up was the diversity of our membership you know i've been to incredible estates that are obviously members i remember going to castle howard and just thinking you know incredible place holcombe hall in in norfolk an incredible farming business paul hoverson of course has done you know so much in that part of the world to really optimize agriculture and then you know our average member you know acreage wise probably less than 300 acres in many mm. ways so the diversity of of our membership and you never know what to expect because you can get the smallest businesses that are just incredible mm. and and you, you know right through to massive massive scale businesses and i suppose that's the strength you know people often the criticism from the outside world is all oh, the nfus about big corporate farming businesses i mean i hope i'm living proof that it's not because you know i'm a tenant farmer we don't own any land at all and um you know effectively if i can if i can be a tenant farmer i'm president of the nfu it shows that it's a it's a very broad church and our membership you know is a really broad church but the best thing for me by far and away is is going out and meeting members going to their farms i can remember being up um in a, a fipple funded area um a while ago out on farm with Tom Hind, some will remember him from AHDB, so up yeah. in the North York Moors. And, you know, farming up there, really, really challenging part of the country. It's stunning, beautiful. But, you know, looking at, at the funding options of what's going on there and, and how how farmers are sort of thinking to the future. They had this, um, you know, so we've seen the milk vending machines and I visited one business where they had a, a meat vending machine so people could just go there and literally buy frozen mm. burgers, steaks, whatever. And, um, you know, it's a big part of their diversification. Mm. You know, so that's that's always the best bit, going out and seeing these these really different businesses. Have you seen any ideas that you think, oh, when I, when I step down and I kind of semi-retired that you'll do at home? Oh yeah, all the time, <laughs> all the time. A lot of them cost me too much money, but yeah. No, you're always seeing, and, and more and more so, because people are, and especially the youngsters coming in, you know, they don't, they don't have the, or a lot of them don't have the same level of concern. They just see this moment in time as, as a real opportunity. And they're just thinking out of the box and thinking differently. You can, I mean, look, here we are doing this. I mean, you know, they're communicating, they're selling, you know, they're not, mm. they could be just at home running a business, running yeah. several businesses. It's it's funny though, isn't it? Like diversification, nice name, but really, at the moment, it's throwing good money after bad, isn't it? Yeah, but I think diversification is changing, isn't it? You know, what, what, and what what is it really? I mean, you know, energy. I think, you know, producing our own energy, farm businesses have massive, massive scope in what we could offer. If we didn't have such a challenging grid. Uh, to export into if we get more to a localized grid you know farm businesses are going to be able to you know supply local communities mm. yeah and the rest of the world do that more if if you could go on holiday for a month at the end of your term where would you go then do you know i don't think i'd want to leave the country i think i'd want to go and do one of the walks somewhere just to I mean, it sounds weird, but I am talking, engaging, communicating all the time. Mm. So there's very little time to just to just stop and think. And, and my daughter, when I'm walking with her, she she always says, you have to walk at half the pace that you are walking. And she said, then you can breathe and you can enjoy the view and chill out. And Because I'm always going flat out. So... Uh, you know, my kids think my work-life balance is, is absolutely knackered. So I, I, I do look forward to just whoosh, stopping. Mm. So, are you counting the days? No. <laughs> it'll be 50-50 because I will be heartbroken to go in some ways. Really will be because it's, it's, it means everything to me. But I will have to let it, let it go and, um, you know, trust in everybody that, I mean, the NFU, look, it's, it's, 
it's well over 100 years old it's come and gone and you know it, it it's changed and it will need to change and be agile to what our members need and it is is always going to need to do that mm. and so the people that lead it you know we, we leave our mark for a moment but you know it's the brand i think and the integrity of it is is what it's about and it it will continue to function i hope uh, uh you know and i and, and you know the members i mean that's what the nfu is about you know it represents effectively three quarters of of farmers and growers um uh, across england and wales and that's why we get to see prime ministers i mean it uh, and it so the mem what i'm saying is without the members it is nothing you can have a great organization but if you're not representing as many people as possible you, you're never going to have the same power so you know we are the largest representative body out there so you know whether it's ahdb joyous red tractor um you know whatever it is we need to be representing the members the the um the job obviously is pretty much full on and then obviously then go home and farm you, you, you get to go, I mean, we're going to cereals now, which is nice, but do you find that when you do go to a show, you can relax a little bit, or is it just too many people talking to you and too much to do? Do they ever say, can you go to that show, but you don't have to do anything? No. No. No, they don't say that. <laughs> um, What's been your favourite show, though? Oh, gosh, I could, that that would be, uh, they're all my favourite show when I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> I think the they are all great shows all of them even when you go to come the... in Cheshire did you say yeah 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 yeah, yeah. But, I mean even the little ones I mean Burwalton show and Shropshire is a, just a lovely little show so they're all that's the one thing that I've agreed to do so I haven't agreed to do anything when I step down but um my local show is Gillingham and Shaftesbury show and they've asked me to be president in 2025 and that's the one thing I've agreed to do mm. and that's you know that's a lovely show and yet yeah, you go to you know, Royal Cornwall last week, the Great Yorkshire, I'll be going to the Royal Welsh, amazing shows. Yeah. Yeah, we're serials. Um, we've now been an hour now in the car, haven't we? So we have been an hour in the car, what have we gone, a mile and a half? If that, yeah, yeah, we could have, we could have walked, couldn't we? We yeah. certainly maybe we <laughs> would have been a lot quicker. Yeah, maybe we should have just left the car at the hotel. We're moving again now. Slowly. Yeah. Yeah, I can see it through the trees, but we're just not really getting there. I may as well wrap this up now. Anyway, um, it's a shame we couldn't do it. There's no signal, but if we could have done it on the live, then people could have fed questions in. But I'm sure if you put questions underneath that you want to ask Manette, maybe she'll she'll read the comments when it's gone live and reply. But thanks for watching, and thanks, Manette, and good luck in your retirement. Thanks, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that if you did let us know in the comments and should i do some more kind of them sort of style interviewee kind of things in the future again let me know thanks for watching and we'll see you later